Welcome, welcome, and thank you so much for including me in this wonderful conversation. Those were some really nice introductions, by the way. You all deserve them. Um, it's been such an honor to watch you work and to learn your story and to, not just in preparing for this panel, but also from, from previous work that we've done together. Um, before we dig into some of the details of what you do and how you do it, I thought we would just start with a more broader conversation about company culture, particularly as in what you've learned in your positions. I know you've been in your positions for a couple of years now. Um, what have you learned about what's working and what's not working and, and how do you make decisions and allocate resources and just what, well, the steps that go behind your broader vision of what makes a company culture work? You can just start anywhere you'd like, but Julie, if I okay. press Maybe you into service. Sure, we can take a, a few different angles. Maybe I'll talk about it from the perspective of um, we work at Accenture with a lot of different companies and sort of week, you know, kind of week in and week out, we're in different C-suites across industries. And one of the biggest challenges for companies today is the challenge and the need to innovate because of the disruption that's going on, particularly around technology. And just to give you a stat, 52% of the S&P 500 that were listed in year, the year 2000 are now gone. And that trend is accelerating when you look at some of the rise of, so Amazon took 24 years to overtake uh, Walmart's market cap. Telsa took seven years to um, overtake the auto um, market caps. And so it's accelerating. And one of the big topics in the C-suite is culture because the companies themselves are really having to transform and it's not enough to have a strategy that says now we're going to be innovative, we're going to be the disruptors. And one of the aspects of culture that's particularly uh, difficult is the idea of um, the, the need to continuously learn and change because technology and the skills that are needed are really affecting all layers of the organization. And so one of the things we've learned at Accenture is that when you, when you ask people to you know, be continuous learners, and our research shows that actually people want to be, so it, you know, you're not forcing people. It's not enough to say, go continuously learn, right? You, you have to invest in that learning. And uh, Ellen is really the architect and can talk a little bit more about what we've done. But the most important lesson was, to establish that culture, there needs to be role modeling, there needs to be investment, and you need to help people understand. And so we've done a lot of investment in the way people learn, uh, using something, for example, called digital learning boards. We have a lot of millennials, and they like to learn differently, a shorter, um, you know, shorter ways of learning. But, uh, but that's really important because at the end of the day, culture isn't just about a leader saying this is our new culture, it's what are the steps you take it. So that's just one angle, there's lots of different angles, but it's one that's quite relevant to a lot of, um, to a lot of companies today. And I think additionally, when, when we went through our cultural transformation as it relates to innovation, one of the first things we had to look at was our leadership and le our leadership DNA. And we had to really reimagine how leaders were going to need to lead in the digital age. And it was quite a profound difference for us because we were um, known and, and famous for being a large scale systems integrator, which many of you may or may not know what that is, but what it, what it felt like inside of Accenture was that there was a lot of standard standard job descriptions, standard tools, standard training, standard methodologies, and that was really our source of differentiation. So to have to become an innovation-led company, leadership had to be totally reimagined. And so we thought about it as our, truly as our leadership DNA, and ha have really driven much of the culture change around innovation, through certainly getting our people to uh, learn and learn more regularly and having them want to learn more regularly, but it was also a big change from, from the leaders as well. You know, I've been in this job 11 years and uh, I remember my first year, uh, Bill Merritt asking me up to his office and he was very emotional and he, um, he, he in essence said, David, who can I count on if I can't count on you to 
help me keep the culture alive. It was devastating, right? And by the way, he didn't mean it as a criticism. He was basically indoctrinating me and making sure I understood there's nothing more important to our company's success and, and all our stakeholders, including our employees, than our conviction uh, around culture. Uh, it's a, it, it was a, a seminal moment for me and certainly has shaped the way that I've pursued culture. Maybe later in the program, I'll tell you about some of the things that uh, I think are really important in terms of nurturing culture. But for now, I'll just tell you sort of something kind of funny, but really illustrates the point. Uh, two mornings ago, as I'm still adjusting to West Coast time, I'm an East Coast boy here. <laughs> so at five o'clock in the morning, my cell phone goes off. I say, God, Jesus, these East Coast people are awake. Why didn't I tear it off my cell phone? So I groggily look over. Whose name do you think I see? It's Bill Marriott. So he's awake, and you know, I'm thinking, <laughs> this is not gonna go well. I'm groggy. <laughs> He's going to ask me some question no human being could possibly know the answer to, and it's just not going to go well. <laughs> so, you know, I pick, up the, I pick up the call. Do you know what he wanted to ask me about? He had read a story about an employee, a married employee, who had been let go in the Midwest. He wanted to know, David, are you sure we did the right thing? Here's an 86-year-old guy, a living legend. The most important thing for him in that morning was to make sure that this human being, that the right thing had happened. Culture is about conviction. Bill Marriott has conviction about the importance of culture to the success of our family, and that is completely enmeshed in all of our lives and the way we approach uh, the business as well. Yeah, I would, I mean, I'd echo everything the rest of the panel said in terms of the importance of culture. You know, at Marriott, I've, I've been at Marriott for over 20 years, pretty much my entire career, and we talk a lot about culture. I know a lot of companies talk about culture. And, um, you know, I think it has to be authentic and real. It, it can't be something that you can just, you know, talk about or try to create. It has to be real and authentic. And I think in the case of our company, it's a 90-year-old company, it started with our founders but then it can't just stay with the founders, it needs to live through successive leaders along the way, and, and not just the CEO, but leaders throughout the company. And I think um, for our company, we've been highly disrupted. I know we're gonna talk about disruption. Uh, travel's been highly disrupted by technology. And our culture has been one of not just taking care of people so they can take care of our guests, we are in the hospitality business after all, but also a culture of constant innovation and change and that's hard at a company that's 90 years old to keep that alive and real. And I think it starts, it started with our founders and it then our current CEO, Arnie Sorensen, is um, you know, an amazing believer of the importance of culture and the importance of um, being willing to take risk, to change, um, to um, have the courage to take calculated risks. So I think the culture is about, um, it's, it's, it's about, it's, got so many facets and lenses to it, it's a hard question to, to, to really answer in a comprehensive way. But it's, I think it's the, it's the, I always truly believe it's the magic sauce at Marriott. And I think David will relate to this. A lot of times when you've been with a company as long as I have, you're like, is, is our culture really special? You know? And a lot of times we have someone that comes from the outside, that comes from another company, maybe doesn't stay forever, and they're like, you know what, actually, this is a real thing. There is not a, an associate at Marriott that doesn't know the phrase. I'm looking at some of my colleagues in the front, take care of the associate, the associate will take care of the guest, and the guest will come back again and again. And it's not just a tagline, it's a true part of our company. And it, um, and it does start with the founders. And um, speaking of the founders, we have two founders. We talk so much about Jay Willard Marriott, but Alice Marriott, his wife, was also the founder of our company, and this is in 1927. And she was an amazing woman. I, um, she was a, a woman ahead of her time, really. And she was like, and since it's International Women's Day. We should play the video. Yeah. I'm dying to see yeah, it. Yeah, it will give you a flavor of our culture and make it real for you, I think. In 1927, visionary pioneers started a company with a simple but powerful idea. If you take care of your employees, they will take care of the customers and the customers will come back. As young newlyweds seeking to build a life together, Jay Willard, or Bill, as he was known, and Alice S. Marriott drove their Model T Ford for thousands of miles across the United States to run a tiny nine-seat root beer stand in Washington, D.C. From those humble beginnings, now more than 90 years later, 
I count myself fortunate to be among the nearly 700,000 people across the world that today represent Marriott International's family of brands. Bill and Alice, or Allie, as she was known, created a world of opportunity for generations of Marriott Associates. And an important part of their story is the role that Allie played in growing the business and how it continues to inspire the women and men of Marriott today. When Allie was just 11 years old, her mother went to work at a hospital after Allie's father died at an early age in the 1918 flu epidemic. A gifted student, she started at the University of Utah at age 15 and four years later graduated Phi Kappa Phi during a time when not many women even attended college. Just a few weeks later, she and Bill were wed and began their 11-day car trip to Washington, D.C. Allie was a pioneer who paved the way for women in business and in the community. When sales of icy root beer waned in the cold of that first winter, she led the transformation that became the Hot Shops restaurants. She was the first chef and was behind many of the operational innovations. She also had responsibility for the business's financial matters as the first accountant. Allie was there every step of the way as the business thrived. Allie was also a devoted mother to J. Willard Marriott Jr., known as Bill Jr., and his younger brother, Richard. Bill would go on to follow in his parents' footsteps to build the hotel company we know today as Marriott International. The first hotel came 30 years after the opening of the root beer stand, and Allie would play a big role in the company's new business. She was the first design executive and personally decorated the early hotels. When the company became a corporation in 1964, she was one of the first board members, the only woman, and the first woman to hold the title of vice president. As her son, Bill Jr. would say, she was a force behind every important decision in the company. My mom and dad were partners, co-founding what is known as Marriott International. What I most admired about my mother was her strong sense of values and her determination. She was quiet and thoughtful devoting much of her time to civic and cultural endeavors. But she was more than that to me. She was my mom, and so much a part of who I am. Allie was also a force in the community. She was the first woman treasurer for the Republican National Committee and was a DC committee representative before the position of delegate was created in the House of Representatives. In the local community, she started a Welcome to Washington Club for the wives of ambassadors who had just moved to the area. Some of Allie's loves were the ballet and the arts. She was on the founding board of the Kennedy Center and raised most of the money for the Eisenhower Theater. She was a business leader, a fundraiser, a political activist in her way. One of Washington, D.C.'s greatest hostesses, she was a remarkable woman of firsts. My grandmother was my hero. Not only did I adore her, but she was such an example to me of how a woman should act, pursue opportunity, and make a difference. She was the definition of grace, elegance, devotion, hard work, and taking risks to create a better tomorrow. She was a trailblazer without knowing it. She did what she thought was right. I hope you are inspired by her story to live your life to its fullest. showed that. I'm so sorry I didn't know that story before now. It is really inspiring. Yeah, what was the decision to, to bring her legacy back to, to You know, it's interesting. Knowledge? That happened two weeks ago. So as we were planning for International Women's Day, um, so I, I, as I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little strange as a CHRO. I probably do all the other things that other people might be doing, like writing scripts. So I frequently write scripts for videos, so on and so forth. And, you know, as I thought more about our culture and International Women's Day, I said, you know, there's a part of our culture, a part of the story of our culture that's not being told. This is a remarkable woman. And so I wrote the script for this thing. I told Arnie, uh, change your calendar. You're going to be <laughs> narrating this thing. We got Debbie, uh, the granddaughter, and our global <coughs> culture officer, board member, in there. And then I somehow snuck Bill Merritt in there to talk about his mom, but it is something that we are going to actively promote in our company. It's so timely, right? Right. To recognize our, 
our company started gender balanced at the top, right? They were co-founders. And today, as I said at the uh, great dinner that um, was hosted last night by Accenture, um, you know, our company today, the C-suite, is gender balanced as well. Uh, Stephanie and I, well, we're 50-50 here. Our, ten, our eight other peers is 50% women in the C-suite. So we have a rich history of empowering women, and I thought it was an important story to tell. Um, before we dig back into the innovation piece, I want to continue on uh, International Women's Day because, because uh, Julie and Alan hosted an incredible convening yesterday, and you can see a lot of the, I think you can see all of it on your website. Yes, so yes. It's coming up and on YouTube. Um, again, very much in the spirit of the day, but also in the spirit of innovation and candor and problem solving and culture. Can you just give us a couple of highlights or what you took away, or what you learned from the day? Well. Um, this might surprise you, but the biggest thing I took away from the entire day is something that my mom said, and my mom is sitting uh, here in the audience. And um, our social media team said, hey, do you and your mom want to do a little video? And I said, sure, and my mo mother reluctantly agreed to do a little video that's now kind of gone viral. Um, but she said something that I thought was so incredibly thoughtful, but very profound, and I won't be able to say exactly what she said, but essentially this was her message. She said when she was growing up, women knew their place, mm. but today, women are every place. And um, <laughs> and when I when I experience this incredible day that our, our uh, entire team who's sitting over there put together for our people and our clients uh, yesterday, that to me summed it up because women were present there. We had CEOs, we had CFOs, we had women from the arts, from science on the stage. It was, it was an incredible convening of women and men, but to me that was the biggest takeaway of the day, women are every place. Beautiful. Fabulous. Do bookmark it. It's extraordinary what they did yesterday, and I was grateful to be able to witness it. So let's dig back into innovation, because I'm really curious. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm also an adolescent boy all of a sudden. Pardon me. <clears throat> <laughs> You're two huge companies, and both of you have, uh, your enterprises have done an extraordinary job capturing some of the elements of a startup true innovation, and I, maybe we can go back to Marriott for a second, because you have, from a commercial and a, and a, a, a human resources employee engagement point of view, have really worked together in an interesting way to make sure that you're capturing and disrupting and re-disrupting while also keeping your employees very happy. Could you talk a little bit about some of that element, and then we can talk together about when do you take risks and you know, when do you adopt a culture of um, sure, you know, um, innovation has always been part of our DNA, but it's never been more important. Um, you know, the statistics that Julie shared at the opening of the panel are really remarkable, right? And companies that have been around forever aren't around anymore. So this idea of being innovative and changing and being open is, is a business imperative. And at Marriott, we very much recognize we have some really great core strengths, right? We've got an amazing global footprint. We've got an amazing culture. We've got 30 incredible brands. We've got so much. We've got a deep understanding of hospitality and travel. But we're still a big company that has its challenges too, right? You know, we can be, um, you know, we can be a bit slow or bureaucratic if we want to be really candid today. Um, we've got so many strengths, but we don't have some of the things that startups have, right? Mm -hmm. And startups have so much, right? They move at a rapid pace, they're creative, they iterate, they have a whole different way of, and so, but they don't have some of the things we have, scale, right? In some cases, culture. So I think one thing at Marriott we've realized is that if we really want to change and grow and be around for, not just be around, thrive for the next decade, we need to figure out a way to partner um, with people that are different than us, and startups are different than us. And with the help of Accenture, I'll, I'll share one example, and I'm sure Julie will, and, and Ellen can add, and, and David as well. You know, we said, okay, how do you do that? That sounds good, and you hear about all sorts of companies doing this. 
but we partnered with um, Accenture on Travel Experience Incubator, and it was a really fantastic effort, which by the way, you know, this is an example too, culturally, I think Marriott and Accenture are so similar and have so many core values the same, so our partnership with Accenture, another big company, was critical, but um, obviously they work across all different industries, but we, um, we did this travel uh, experience incubator and we invited, I think it was close to 200 different um, uh, startups to um, apply, um, a little bit of a Shark Tank, maybe that's a bad example, but you know, like a 12-week <laughs> program where they um, uh, we accept, we, they applied, we accepted five startups, and we had two internal startups groups, um, and then they did a 12-week kind of sprint um, to um, put together their ideas and to give you a feeling for the kind of startups. That it, they were all related to travel, obviously. So there was one on facial recognition. There was the circadian clock one. You remember okay. there was you know home sharing. There was all sorts of different startups, and anyhow. They um, then kind of did their pitch day at the end and we're actually gonna potentially invest in and actually do some pilots with them. But it was a really good example with the help of Accenture of how a big company can change and innovate by being humble enough, honestly, to realize what we're not good at. And honestly, for the startups to be humble enough to know what they're not good at, right? And how we can take the best of both worlds and actually change a big company like Marriott. That's just one real life example of something that we're doing to innovate. You know, I, I would add to that, Stephanie, um, we would call each other uh, our closest business partners on Absolutely. the team. And it's probably something we all should examine, right? It's not the CFO, although I have a great relationship. We're all friends on our team, right? But she would acknowledge that, you know, when you're in the service industry, it's all about the confluence of product and service. Uh, techn the advancing technology only makes that more important. If you think about the luxury experience and how complex that is, Sometimes a luxury traveler wants to leave me alone, give me the technologies to define uh, my luxury experience. And sometimes they want high-end person, human-delivered service. And frankly, as technologies advance and empower them to create luxury, uh, their luxury experience, personalized, the expectations for human-delivered service rise. And that's why we need to work together to make sure that you know, our offerings to the public are, are, are right you know, it's symbolized best by my former head of talent development. Uh, my direct report is now Stephanie's head of the customer experience at Marriott. Cool. So just to yeah. represent yeah. the intersection of human resources and all things brand, customer, technology, it is the future of uh, human resources and something I encourage you all to, to think about. Stephanie and I have sponsored the company's techno the innovation blueprint uh, several years ago to uh, increase the company's capacity for innovation. She, er she and I and a couple of our colleagues spearhead the company's strategic agenda. So not prototypically where HR would necessarily play, but I will tell you essential today for companies uh, to be able to thrive in today's environment. I would say just as um, from the perspective, one of the things that we really saw that I thought you guys did so well was that, and this is your point about having like the courage to sort of say what are you good at and what are you aren't is, or what do you need to change is when we did the incubator with you, which I agree, I think the shared values and actually Stephanie and I co-sponsored it, which yeah. was really fun. Yeah, awesome. And, uh, but was also you reimagined how you were gonna operate. I mean, we, we did this, in August, and by December, there were pilots to present to the entire C-suite, which is a remarkably fast time yeah. uh, for large companies. And it was about having, and this goes back to this leadership DNA, do you have leaders who can take a step back, reimagine, and say, okay, so we're now gonna do this. This isn't gonna be the regular project where it's four layers down and it takes six weeks to get on the calendar and there's lots of approvals, but to say if we wanna move speed, do we have to do something different? We had one of, yesterday actually at the women's conference we had, we had this uh, woman from one of the incubators here in San Francisco and I asked her the question, I said, well what do big companies need to do? And she went straight to, you need to think about what is the process to lead to innovation? Because if you try to say we're gonna be innovative and you don't think about that process and that you're not gonna get there. And we spent a lot of time upfront saying, in order to be successful, 
It's not, you know, three layers down. It was Stephanie and I co-sponsoring it with David. We, you put your best people, we put our best people, and we said we're going to have a process that's aimed to agility. And I think that's really important as leaders, as we're helping our companies, is to have the courage to say that and to recognize. And by the way, those other things, they may be the right way to run lots and lots of parts of our business, but if we're going to help our companies, you know, be innovative and move forward, we have to recognize that we have to reimagine some of the ways we're actually working. I actually would say that companies need to try to attack some of that other stuff as well, because if you're telling your people, you know, they have the license to innovate, but everything, every part of the way they experience the rest of the company is hard, right? They don't trust. They don't trust that they can actually go out and do experimentation and take a progress is greater than perfection mindset if everything they do, you know, how they how they get met how their performance gets measured or how they have to recruit people or how they have to get funding for projects. If all that stays very bureaucratic and very process driven, mm. there's really a disconnect between what you're saying and what you're doing. And that's why I'm so fascinated by you know, your talent person becoming the, the, the guest experience person because that's the way you do that front to back and then I believe magic starts to happen. Communication is a really important part of that as well. Um, one of the things you see a lot of companies say, we want to be innovative, and then you ask them, well, how do you communicate? Yeah. You know, and it's all memos, right? And, and, and it's not, it's, it's like when I became CEO, I said, I'm not going to send out memos anymore. I'm going to use video. And then we're, now there's new, new different ways to do touch casts and different things. And it's about the feeling because if you're saying you want to be, innovative and learn and everything about even the way you communicate feels old right then it's it there really is a disconnect and and i th and it does lead to a lack of trust what I, and speaking of communications one of the coolest things that happened was our tech team and we're very blessed to have amazing technology people created a 3d hologram of our boss so now Pierre <laughs> can literally uh -huh. show up in true size, in 3D. Do not be... tell Bill Marriott that. <laughs> <laughs> that was just you a would good have thing. been in your sleeping room. Oh, my Lord. You can actually show up in your hotel room <laughs> versus call you. <laughs> but it, it is, I mean, it, it, it does give people a whole kind of sense of, you know, how might we, what the art of the possible might be in the way we work and the way we you know, serve any kind of customer or client or guest. And uh, I, I agree with Julie, communication is really important. I have a great question from the crowd. If human resources and brand and commercial are converging in these interesting ways, what new roles do you anticipate are coming up and how can people prepare for them, even in the smaller companies? That's a great question. You know, one of the things, uh, that we put in place in our company a couple of years ago are called talent network teams. So what they are is any senior leader in our company can, who's facing some business challenge can say, I'm gonna commission a talent network team and it goes on a digital board and any employee in any department can uh, post to it, right? And can apply, and usually there are projects that go six, eight weeks, but what's the great thing about that? If you're in finance and always want to know what be like to work in marketing, you can post for one of those marketing jobs. So it's a great way for people to sort of cross train, get to know the business. Break the silos. In a different perspective, break, break silos. silos. Yeah. And by the way, from a diversity and inclusion perspective, there's a lot of research, and I think you're gonna see this emerge more and more. The more you increase uh, interaction between people, the better the community inside your company. You know, if we're really honest with ourselves, a lot of our diversity and inclusion practices have almost uh, accentuated the opposite. Everybody's sort of single identity, attend to your interests. We take a very different approach. We want to be sensitive to the unique needs of every segment, but we know the strength of our company is the extent that we promote a family atmosphere where everybody works together and recognizes we have a lot more in common than the differences uh, between us. So those talent network teams bring people together and in that way, you know, also help people understand 
the broader complexity uh, of, the, uh, of the business. We actually have, by the way, not just that we swapped people, right? So the talent development person become the customer experience person. Steffi and I also sponsor sort of a hybrid department that reports to both of us. It's called Brand HR. Their job is specifically to work between human resources and the customer folks to really understand the meshing. You know, how are we going to bring new products to the public and what are the implications both for the customer side and the human resources you, you side? Know, just to build on that a little bit and to make it real with some examples. So the connection between my team, which is brand and sales and marketing and IT, our CIO is on my team too, so technology and David's team. You know, everything that we're doing, we always have, we have a great phrase, high tech and high touch. We are in the hotel business after all, right? In the people business. But how can we, things that, technology that's gonna impact the jobs at our hotels. So we, a big thing that we're rolling out, we've rolled out globally is mobile check-in and mobile check-out, right? So that you don't need to go to the front desk. Well then what are the implications then to the front desk job? Is it gonna go away? No, it doesn't need to go away. It can be completely reimagined to be more about enhancing the guest experience, sync an Uber concierge, and it can be a local area knowledge expert. And that when the front desk clerk no longer needs to check people in and out very transactional, he or she can reinvent their job and be something even deeper. So this is an example of how we're partnering together to think how technology can not it can enhance people's jobs and it can change the jobs at the hotel level as just one real life example that, um, that we've experienced in our business. I think there are, to, to give two specific examples of roles in HR that are going to be extraordinarily critical and just building on uh, David and Stephanie's point is you need to train a, at least a couple of people in either your HR organization or people you can tap into from somewhere else in your organization to be true design thinking leaders. Mm -hmm. Because that's when you start to really reimagine experiences both for your people and for, for your um, guests or customers. So really teaching people how to lead design thinking sessions to get into this innovation mindset is one, I think, new skill that needs to be resident in HR. And then the other, which might seem a little bit odd, but you need to get someone who really is starting to get very well versed in neuroscience. And why is that? Hmm. Julie mentioned that we need to move to a world where we're learning all the time and that you know, 77% of our company are millennials, they want to learn differently. But the fact of the matter is, is deep learning happens differently than the traditional learning models. And because the rapid pace of change is only accelerating, really truly understanding how deep learning happens so you can re, uh, reimagine again how your people are going to learn, I think is going to be such an important role uh, that HR plays, if not today, in the very, very near future. So if I pitched a story to Fortune that HR is going to save the world, I can back that up. <laughs> I feel like I can. I Ellen feel saves the world. I know David I've watched does. her. I've seen it. <laughs> but I do think that we that's such an important point, and I had never considered the neuroscience piece. That this is this is really transforming the way organizations evolve. Absolutely. Can I ask a question of the how, how many of you are in HR? Okay. okay. I think it's important to, um, since there are a lot of you are in HR, I'll just say this, because um, I have the, the stage <laughs> and the mic. Um, I do think all of the things around learning and um, you know, experiences are important, but I do feel compelled to say the most important thing about what we do as professionals is the people. Yes. And we are, we are at a time, not just in our own country here in the United States, but all over the world, where we're at an inflection point, both because of digital disruption, but also just all of the social issues that are happening with movement of people, with sexual harassment issues, and that's not just a US issue either, exactly. that being truly human and being very connected and caring and compassionate with your people is I think the most important thing that HR leaders and HR people at large can do. Let me, let me amplify that point because it is so important. 
Now, I always say to my team, uh, global HR team, that they need to keep in mind that they, are, they have a higher calling. I mean, we are fiduciaries. We have to make sure that our different stakeholders are getting the appropriate return. In our case, it's not just our shareholders, but our owners and franchisees. But our higher calling is to ensure that the most vulnerable stakeholder, which almost always is the employee, is not left behind. You cannot have a sustainable business if your employees are not benefiting and feeling that over time, it, it's to their benefit to be part of the company. So I can't say, it has to start with that conviction. If you're gonna make big things happen in your company, it starts with your conviction about your highest calling, and that is to ensure that we are attending to people and culture, and that over time, your employees, in their hearts and minds, they are saying, it's to my, my benefit to, for me and my family to be associated with uh, the company. And trust me, if you get that right, everything else will follow. They'll be inspired to serve your customers better. They'll be inspired to innovate and keep your business fresh and vibrant for the future. Ellen, can I? Oh, oh, can I just add one thing? Of course. I think it's important that as you think about that is that that's not something you do in isolation. I mean, what makes Ellen, I mean, such an amazing chief leadership and human resources officer is she's a business leader and you can, and that is what makes David and you hear oh, about the okay. partnership. And, and so in order to have the higher calling and be effective, you have to have that partnership with the business and that lens and even that anticipation of the lens because there are things that are going to happen from technology that aren't there yet but that you need to build the infrastructure and the thought. And so I would just say from the opposite side of being a partner with Ellen um, is that it's to, in order to fulfill that, it has to be really seen as that partnership, and that's how we can be really effective together. And, and I think you've seen that in the way even Ellen and David have talked. It's completely a partnership. The HR is a business leader as well, and that's, I think, really important. That, that is such an important point. And when businesses fail, it's when HR leaders fall for the premise that it's okay, just be a good business partner, right? Sort of understand the finances and stop there you have a higher calling. You must yeah. be a great business partner, but you must always, always remember that you are accountable for the most vulnerable stakeholder. Mm. And the most sustainable way to run a company is to ensure that your culture and your people, that things are strong and you know, business will follow. Ellen, I'd like to ask you to talk us about um, inclusion starts with the I. Sure. It's such an important piece of how you've been able to scale this exact sentiment maybe a little bit about the process in which you've developed it. And I was privileged enough to be at the launch and it was one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen as it rippled through the company. Yeah, um, I'm gonna just take two minutes to take us back almost uh, two summers ago um, when uh, the police shootings were happening here in the United States. And um, I happened to be in London. I was engaged in some business issues outside. I wake up one morning on my morning time to go home and my, f my phone's ringing and I look and it's Julie Sweet, which means it's in the middle of her night. And she's calling me to, to not tell me about some business issue, but to tell me that she's frightened because there have been these police shootings and we need to make sure our people are okay, physically okay and safe, but also emotionally okay and safe. And so I, you know, was getting on a plane to come home. I touched down, I called one of my mentees, Darnell Thompson, and I called to comfort him uh, because he's a, a, a black man with a young family to connect with him and make sure he was okay. And I started to cry and he ended up having to comfort me. And that was the moment that Julie and I knew that we needed to bring conversations about race into our workplace. And that's not a conversation that we had ever really had in our workplace, to be honest with you. But Darnell had expressed extreme anger about these shootings that were happening, but the anger was not at all placed towards police. It was placed toward the fact that he was showing up in the office every day and nobody was talking about what was happening yeah. and he was scared his son was going to get shot in the street. 
And so we did convene a conversation, and that's when we started really understanding that building bridges and really bringing conversations into the workplace that were most important to our people were what our obligation, our higher calling was. And then we went out and started asking a lot of our people how they were feeling. And what we learned and what happened was our employees started telling us uh, among every segment, right? So not just individual segments that you would consider diverse. It was every, everyone, white men, uh, people with disabilities, people that were uh, transgendered, all had a story to tell about how they feel. And uh, a group of those people created a, a video, some of you may have seen it, um, called Inclusion Starts With I, which really gives voice to our people to talk about how they feel. And um, the importance of that is that um, people don't always, people, people don't always share how they're feeling openly and it allowed us to open up a very important conversation with all of our people and to move past inclusion and diversity to start creating a true sense of belonging so that you create the emotional connection with your, your people. And since that period of time, I'll call it productivity because that is something we can measure in our company, has gone up dramatically. Uh, but what was, has really happened as, is that we have created true trust-based relationships with our people. I just need a moment to process that. Having watched the launch and seen the impact of people feeling invited to share what, help, what was making them feel separate from other people or invisible was extraordinary. And I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to show it today, but, if, but do go out of your way to see it because it really was special and courageous. We only have a couple, we have a couple of minutes left and I've got some lightning round questions from the crowd. Mm -hmm. um, how should we change our approach to training our leaders or training ourselves to prepare for this world that's moving so fast? I'll, I'll give one quick thing. We've changed our um, concept of training our leaders from doing what you're doing today to make creating immersive experiences where we actually put our leaders on the stage <laughs> to practice the things that we want them to learn. So they're actually doing while they're learning. It's like a flipped classroom. Flipped classroom, yeah. <laughs> what I do personally, and then what I'm asking our people to do wherever I go. So I personally, I set my own learning goals every quarter because I find if I don't do that, like work is really busy in life and I, you know, I think of it as, you know, part of my, it's part of my job. So that's just sort of my personal way of saying what's my goals. It's how and, she became a blockchain expert. <laughs> She's a real learner. <laughs> you know, and, um, and then what I've asked our people to do because I don't think we live in a world where it can all be, we come here and we take people is to say, if you supervise anyone, so if you have a team then every month you should be hosting some kind of training for that team. And we're very lucky through Ellen, we have an incredible access to a lot of different kinds of training, but we have leaders in every office. And, and people are really responding to this. It was like this light bulb. It's like, don't wait for someone else. And you as a leader, and that means even our young managers, if you know, you know what you and your team need to learn about. Like you're the best curator of what is gonna be most effective. And we have you know, tons of support that you can do it. And I, I just started doing this a few months ago as a way of making learning more, um, like it's a challenge. Like every meeting I go to is to sort of challenge that. And the response at all levels has been amazing to doing that. Maybe, maybe I'll share a, a real life example that we're facing on the training front. Of course, this is David's area. He, he can add, add a lot more, but Marriott acquired Starwood at the end of 2016. And one of the things we're still working on this year is integrating the two companies from a systems perspective. And 
we woke up and we realized within a few months we need to integrate thousands and thousands of hotels over to a new set of systems, not to get into the details. But we thought, how in God's name, again, we're in 127 different countries, and in a few months are we going to train 46 different audience groups, in this case, hundreds of thousands of people overnight onto a whole new set of systems and processes. And it really forced us, it was an event that forced us to think about training differently, right? And, and a, a gentleman who works on David's team, who has been leading the training effort, forced us to use technology different to train, to do training in bite-sized pieces, right? Instead of the old way we used to train people, fly people in, classroom training, you know, and we've evolved quite a bit beyond that. But this forced us to think super outside the box, to engage new some technology, again, to do bite-sized training by role, to think about how to do it in multiple languages, right? Because again, how are we going to do this? And how are we going to train a hotel in the middle of like, Africa that's got no other hotels around it, right? So it was just a really, it was a real life example that forced us to think about how to use technology to do training super quick super creatively, and I, I thought it was, it, it pushed us a little, don't you think? I can give a testimony. So Stephanie and David do know this, but my, my husband's a Marriott employee for 35 years. Doing a great job. He had, job. To, do, he had job. to do all the, the, the bite-sized <laughs> trainings, and he, he really, yeah. it, and it was in a pretty short period of yeah. time because I saw him doing them. And he was like ready to go. He was ready to go, so it worked. Yeah, good. I'm glad. That's good. And he's old, you know. <laughs> he's not a millennial. It works for everybody. <laughs> I'm afraid Hopefully, we're... that's not videoed. <laughs> Lots of video, yeah. I'm afraid we're out of time. Any last flash, like ten seconds or less, thoughts for the audience? I'll give one for all the HR people out there. All right. There has never been a better time to be an HR person than there is today. Exciting. So please enjoy it. That was perfect.